Now, there is this idea, you know, of Taoism. But <laughs> that's something that is, uh, that is something we, we I, I'm afraid that that is also something that was invented by the West, you know. The West have been grappling, of course, with Chinese religion from the very beginning, because they find it very hard to understand. Um, that was especially so when people came to China who wanted to convert the Chinese. That idea, you know, that the Chinese would be converted to Christianity, that's one of the oldest, uh, I, I don't know if you can call it a utopia or, or a, a, a brain scheme, but that exists in the West. You know who started that? Marco Polo, who went to China in, in 1275. And you know why he went? He, of course, he went there to make money. But he said to his fellow Venetians, no, he went to convert the emperor of China, the great Han, to Christianity, because that was a, an honorable and, and, and a way of, of looking at things. Huh? And he already, and then afterwards, of course, you had these, uh, these Jesuits, you know. Father Matteo Ricci, in a typically Western way, as some kind of capital investment. The most intelligent young guys from Italy were trained to study Chinese and got lots of money and they went via Macau and then to China. And first they de disguised themselves as, as, as Buddhist monks. And then they disguised themselves as Confucian literati. And then they invented something that is called Confucianism. Why? In order to facilitate. They found among all the different scala of different uh, philosophical and religious traditions, China is very rich, it's an enormous country with the longest uh, un, uh, unbroken cultural history in the world. So of course it's teeming with all kinds of, of, of forms of, of religious uh, feeling and expression and so on. Eh? And one was the kind of outcast, and that was that of the poor teachers of classical Chinese. They were called the Ru, the weaklings. That's the translation of it, the Ru. And uh, uh, he, he had to learn Chinese, so he learned by them, you know. And they, they complained because the emperor at that time, that was Emperor Wanli of the end of the Ming, he didn't like them. He, he, he said... That, that, that all that Confucian thing and morality and all that uh, school teaching, he, he, he was fed up with that, you know, he, he had too much of that, he, he didn't want that. So, so they complained bitterly and, and he took his side. They were all gay, uh, Matteo Ricci was also gay, they loved each other, they danced with each other, they, they just found each other. Ricci didn't want to go back to, to, to Rome anymore. He, he just loved it in China. And the Chinese loved him too. He, they, they developed a great love and so on. So he baptized them. They thought it was very funny, you know. They, they had a great time together. And he, he, he brought them all kinds of things, you know, prismas and, 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 uh, and uh, field glasses and all of that. They, they, they had a, a wonderful, a wonderful time. And, and so So he, he took her side. And he said, you know, the only valuable thing I found in China, of course, his, his, his experience of China was extremely limited, and his Chinese was not good either. How do we know? Because we found in the, in the Bibliothèque Nationale of Paris, we found the manuscript of his translation of the Roman Catholic Mass. Well, I don't know how teaching of China is now, but I suppose that a, a graduate student in, in an American university would do a better job. You know, it, 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 it's not very good, but it doesn't matter. He was the first one, he, he was, but he, 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 he said, the only thing I really find valuable in whole China is, is this, uh, this confusion. It's one of the three teachings. So he thought together with Buddhism, that's a religion, but it's not a religion, so it's a philosophy. So he put that forward, he said, that's it. And uh, as long as the Chinese are, belong to this Confucianism, they can also be Christian, they can be compatible. It can be compatible. You, can be, you cannot be a Christian and a Buddhist at the same time, or you cannot be Christian and Muslim at the same time, or you cannot be Christian and Taoist at the same time, but you can be Christian and Confucian at the time. That goes, that goes well, perfectly well. So he said, they don't have to change. 
They're wonderful. They're great guys. They have morality, they have upright, they love their parents, and so they, they are the, 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 the best there is in me. So he converted them, and then he let them continue to worship their ancestors and do their annual sacrifices to Confucius and so on. But when later the Dominicans came from Manila and also wanted a piece of the Christian pie in China, they were not of the same opinion. They said, that's idolatry, that's very bad, you can't do that. So they, 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 they refused that. That sparked the rights controversy. And perhaps people don't know that nowadays, but that was the big, big thing for centuries. For centuries, it went up and on. There were so much arguments. The greatest philosophers of those times, first of all Spinoza, who in Amsterdam, in the middle of the 17th century, when Amsterdam was, was seething with Chinese publications about China, images of China, Chinese ceramics, and so they were amazed. He got his idea of this kind of natural, spontaneous. He, he got it from Huh? Thanks to this riot controversy that, 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 that uh, proclaimed and, and, and diffused uh, this, this, this Confucian, uh, this Confu or Chinese, as a matter of fact, cosmology and about the Tao and the great principle and yin and yang, they started families. And then, of course, Leibniz, uh, who, who wrote his famous tractatus on the natural uh, theology of, of the Chinese. It was so influential, so influential, and, and uh, whole China during the, the late, uh, whole Europe, I mean, during the whole uh, late 17th century, early uh, 18th century, you know, they went through a, you cannot imagine how, how big China was for them and everything. There were Chinese gardens, it changed our perception of space uh, completely from the geometrical model of nature we inherited from the Greeks, we got the medal of the spontaneous uh, form of nature with rock gardens and, and little ponds and so on. The landscape garden comes also from China. And of course drinking tea. Uh, so so the, the influence was fantastic. But it shaped the image of the West and of Chinese religion. And that was nice, of course, but it didn't correspond to Chinese reality at all. So what happened? What happened that when, when, when the West then had got all this from China and were dressing in Chinese clothes and drinking Chinese tea, which become very habit forming, we bought all these things from China. And that was economically ruinous. China is, of course, a country full of philosophers, we all know, and uh, full of uh, all kinds of beautiful things. But China is also the first and greatest manufacturing and trading nation the world ever has known. Uh, China ruined the Roman Empire by the silk trade. Uh, therefore, the, the, the Romans called China Ceres, uh, the, book, the land of silk. That silk that traveled over the Silk Road once it arrived in, 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 in Rome, and you made garments of it, togas for the rich uh, Roman ladies, they, the cost was ruinous, but they couldn't stop buying it. That happened once. The second time it happened in the 18th century. This tea trade, the place where I live, in Fudro, was the center of this tea trade. Look at the center of Fudro, the beautiful old building. Very decrepit nowadays, but they still stand there. You know, that was the richest city of, 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 of China. Fantastic. Uh, but it was ruinous. Those tea clippers, you know, who, who, those cutty sarks who, who brought the tea uh, to, to England. And, uh, they, they, it was a ruinous trade. We bought the Chinese, but the Chinese didn't buy anything back. So that problem had to be resolved. Nowadays, we're living the same thing. Huh? 
We have secretaries of state and all visiting China saying, this China trade is ruining us. The re history has some way of, of repeating itself. Sure. We don't learn. We, they, we, we just can't learn. So, uh, what happened then, I mean, in the, in the 18th century, was very, ha was very bad. That's a really black page in the history of, 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 we should never forget that. Because a certain guy called Lord McCartney, uh, in 1793, he went with a letter of King George, I don't know which King George, there's so many of them, uh, uh, to the Chinese throne and he had lots of gifts for the emperor and he said, uh, let's establish official relations and let's try to do some, open your market. Because he had learned from all these writings that the Chinese emperor was uh, the most powerful potentate. He could do everything. The Chinese emperor could do everything except open trade. That was not his problem. The Chinese state had nothing to say about trade. There was no ministry of commerce who was doing trade? That were the guilds and corporations of China. The so-called Kongsi, uh, the common wheel trades, the Hanghui. Uh, they had that. And their temples. And their Shihui. The word Shihui, which means society in China, in Japanese, it means commercial society. Uh, it's, it's, all, it's all one one. The emperor had nothing to say about that. The Chinese themselves tried very hard. When McCartney sailed from what is now Hong Kong, uh, he, he sailed to, to Tianjin, pe pe near Beijing. He was waylaid on his way by the very full powerful merchant guilds of a city called Ningbo. They stopped him. They said, don't go to Beijing. Do trade with us. It's useless. You can't get anything. McCartney didn't believe it. He had read in the books that the, the Chinese emperor could grant everything. Like nowadays, huh? all these businessmen, they run to government officials to do this and that. But the government officials only can think they pocket money. You know, that's the only thing they can do. They can't really help you to build your... You, you have to be... It's, it's, it's somewhere else. History repeats itself a little bit, I'm afraid. So, they couldn't. This, uh, this uh, embassy of Lord McCartney, extremely famous. The first pictures of China the, the, huh, uh, were made and, and so on. And he, they traveled with a lot of people and, and wrote many reports how beautiful China was. And of course, China was far more advanced at that time than any Western country. Uh, they, they were amazed in what they saw. The treasures, the beauty, the wealth of China. We think of China as a poor country, but at that time it was an extremely affluent country. So they were amazed. But the, the embassy itself, well, was a big, uh, uh, how do you call it? Well, didn't work. Huh? It, uh, fiasco. That's what I mean. It was a fiasco. So I don't know whether it's true or not, but according to the Chinese archives, McCartney made a secret threat. He said, if you do not open the market, he told the old Emperor Chen Long, we will import opium. Because opium and opium smoking, which was invented by my ancestors, the Dutch, to subdue the Javanese and, uh, and uh, to make them tame, to mix opium with tobacco and then, then smoke it. It had been found that the Chinese also liked it. Opium was forbidden in China, except for medical purposes. And the emperor believed that as he had signed as a young man an edict in the early 18th century to forbidding opium, that that law stood. Well, it didn't, like the laws against uh, uh, abuse, uh, abusive substances in the United States. You can addict as many laws as you want. People will just do it. It's the same in China. 
But the big difference is that instead of having a Mexican border, China had a, a sea border of thousands of kilometers long of all kinds of creeks, which was completely indefensible. Moreover, China didn't have any, any customs, not any army or anything to do. China was completely open. So the English, uh, I'm getting a bit far from religion now, but I mean, it's, it's part of the story. I mean, they, 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 they consciously and, and, and with lots of money built opium plantations in northern India and then, of course, uh, as subjects of His Majesty, uh, the King of England, they didn't sell it directly, they sold to sold uh, country traders who then smuggled it on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the coast. And you just look at the figure. The opium addiction doubled every year from the end of the 18th century, all through the 19th century, until 1907. Finally, the Western powers who became filthy rich by this opium trade. Perhaps we should return the money? <laughs> huh? uh, filthy rich by this opium trade. Huh? They finally signed an agreement in Lausanne saying that uh, they would stop smuggling opium into China. Uh, okay, that's a long story. But it has something to do with what I want to say. That is that there was a misunderstanding about what China was about and how Chinese society was. And when the West became more and more powerful and interfered more into China, and the idea of uh, this Confucian China was taken over by not any longer the Catholic missionaries, but then by the Protestant missionaries, who at the end of the first Opium War in 1842 were allowed now officially to operate in China and even got immunity and uh, official rank as Chinese officials. Yes, sir. They took over that idea and they started to work with all their money and all their power to make China similar to the image they had. China had to become as they wanted it. So that's what you see here, the university. Uh, that's how we wanted to China to be. So, so, so that's it. But in fact, has it really changed? 